The compressor doesn't really know that it's an inverter compressor necessarily. It's just getting three phase AC voltage. So we're still going to check for shorts across the windings and we're still going to check for shorts to ground. So that process hasn't changed. Now, what we should get for resistance across those windings, again, is going to be model specific. So in our service manual, we want to find what that resistance reading should be. But it's that simple, right? We want to check for shorts across windings. If we don't have any, we want to check for shorts to ground using a Megger. This episode brought to you by Mitsubishi Electric Train and the Metis HVAC Tech Show, bringing you technical information for Mitsubishi Electric VRF, ductless, ducted, and hydronic heat pump systems. Learn more at MitsubishiComfort.com. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Did You Know the ESCO HVAC podcast. So we are spending some time with Bryn Raptor and Paul Shavs from Mitsubishi Electric Train. How are you guys doing? Not bad, Clifton. How are you? I'm doing well. You know, I've had some time to get to know you guys much better over this last year. Got to hang out on the Metis Tech Show and talk a little tech and a little food. And I encourage everyone that's joining us to make sure to hop over there and, and check out the Metis Tech Show. It's a great podcast, lots of technical information. That's really what we're doing here today. We're sharing some of that expertise with our own audience to talk a little bit about inverter diagnostics. You know, as we start making a technological transition, we're starting to see a lot of new technology, a lot of new refrigerants as well. But that shift into inverter technology is one that many educators and many technicians are still a little uncomfortable with because it is a very drastic change from our previous single stage and two stage equipment that we've been working on for decades. So let's dive a little bit into inverters and have an understanding of the components and how we can actually diagnose some of those. Like, where do we even begin? Yeah, I mean, I think what's helpful uh, to discuss is generally the path of electricity. And, you know, we're going to talk specifically about our equipment, but it's not really that different when we're talking about inverters. Um, so we have multiple different boards uh, in our systems uh, when we're talking about outdoor units. And so those boards break down as essentially uh, a noise filter, a uh, power inverter board, which is where we actually do that uh, inversion to drive the compressor. Then we have our control board, and then uh, in some instances, we'll have an MNET power board. And so with any sort of electrical diagnosis, one of the most important things is knowing where your electricity starts and where it is going, right? So in order to diagnose something like an inverter, uh, the actual process of what we're doing to drive our compressor uh, through that inverter is we're essentially taking incoming voltage, uh, typically going to be 208, 230. We're going to convert that into DC voltage and then utilize that DC voltage through a series of switches in order to create what's called a simulated three-phase AC voltage. So with our particular equipment, we have the ability to test each of those steps. So coming into our inverter board, like I said, we typically have that 208, 230. And we hit our diode stack, which uh, essentially a diode is a one-way flow, right? A flow check for uh, electricity. So when we hit that diode stack with AC voltage, what we're actually doing is cutting off the entire bottom portion of that waveform, right? With an AC right. voltage, we get this sine wave uh, frequency. Uh, and so when we hit that diode stack, we're cutting off the bottom portion of that sine wave. So we're creating uh, an a, a DC voltage. And typically, because there are capacitors in our inverter circuit, we get what's called a power factor. So when we actually measure for that DC voltage, it's going to be around 300 volts DC for a 208-230 system. And in our case, if we were ever to want to check that on our boards, we have two locations we can do that. Uh, we can check it on the inverter board itself at a connector called CNDC. It's pretty easy to remember, connector 4DC. Uh, but it also travels up to our control board. A lot of times our inverter board or our power board is buried behind the other boards. Sure. So right. with our control board, we also have that CNDC connector on the outside of that control board. So it's a quick, easy check. We can check there for that high voltage DC, typically 300 volts. Uh, and... If we have that there, we've already verified, okay, I have that incoming voltage, 208, 230, and I've converted to that DC voltage of 300 volts DC. So this tells us that the switches that are actually responsible for making that simulated three-phase AC have the proper voltage. Hmm. So then 
after that, right, we take that DC voltage, we have to clean it up because it's dirty, right? Typically DC voltage, we have a nice straight line, no frequency. Right. Uh, but when we simulate or when we hit that diode stack, we get a much more dirty DC voltage. Sure, right out of that AC sine wave, right? We're right, exactly. Clean it and trip so we have to fill in those, those peaks and valleys, right? Sure. We need that nice straight line. So we go through uh, a smoothing circuit, which is essentially going to clean up that voltage. And we're going to pass through capacitors, which are going to help fill in those right. valleys. So we get that nice sure. straight DC voltage. So once we've gotten out of there, we go into what's called IGBTs, right. uh, insulated gate bipolar transistors. Yes. Uh, put simply, they're switches. Switches. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're switches. They switch very quickly, right? They have the ability to open and close so fast that if you were to hook up a, an LED light to every time they turned on, it would just look like it was always on. Right. It's, it's they open so and close. Yeah. Super fast. So when we hit those switches, what we're doing is there's essentially two IGBTs per leg of that compressor. Right. Of our three. So, degrees. yep. Six total IGBTs, two per leg of the compressor. And what they're essentially doing is opening and closing in order to recreate a simulated three phase AC voltage to our compressor. Yeah, that's a big topic that we get from technicians is I've heard it's AC and I've heard that it's DC. And which one is it? Does it depend on the manufacturer? Because I've heard this manufacturer uses AC and this manufacturer uses DC. And when we really look at it, you know, we started with AC. We are focusing on a DC supply and then we're using three switches three pairs of switches to be able to recreate a cleaner AC sine wave so that we can now modulate frequency. So it is truly a simulated AC sine wave. And that's the key phrase there. It's a simulated. So it walks and talks and acts and smells and sounds like three phase AC. Yes. And that's how we should treat it. We should treat it as three phase with, with a couple of, of exceptions. There's no reversing any two leads or you know uh, right. or changing no anything for reversing. Right. we don't do that and and we don't measure the voltage at the terminals at the compressive terminals ever because it's dc and it will arc and it will destroy something maybe a meter maybe a board but uh just to to add to what to what brent said and good job there brent but we recommend a true rms meter yes and absolutely needle leads you know the little micro, micro. needle leads to that yes and the boards the boards and i remember the first time i opened up um a heat pump with a printed circuit board in it and i almost lay down on the ground in the fetal position i let it <laughs> for me. what is it but monster? It, yeah it's just electricity and we don't have to worry about unless there's a replaceable fuse on on a board don't let it intimidate you right it's power in and power out the diagrams are pretty easy to follow they're accessible to anybody who wants to get them Look at the diagram, follow the path, which is what we do every day. Troubleshooting electrical problems, follow the path, power in, power out. It's that simple. That's a great simplification because a lot of people don't think about it as that. They think about all of these different boards and they're doing all these different things. And when we step back and realize, you know, what an inverter circuit is doing, it really is those three processes. We are converting AC into DC. We are cleaning up the DC. And then, then we are turning around and recreating it in a simulated sine wave. And those three processes could be on one board. It could be three separate boards, but the functionality of an inverter is that combination of processes. It is the same process across all of our equipment, whether it's a residential heat pump or a VRF commercial, it's the same process. And you're right. It's just the different boards, different types of boards are a different number, number of boards. That's the biggest difference. So what happens a lot too is uh, you get the question, well, why do we do that, right? What is the point of taking AC voltage, turning it into DC, and then creating this simulated AC? And the biggest thing is, is that when we have incoming voltage, 208, 230, all we get for frequency is 60 hertz. Yeah, true. Right? We can only get We're 60 running. hertz mm -hmm. out of that 208, 230 coming in. When we go through this process of inverting, we can now have an adjustable frequency. That adjustable frequency is what allows us to increase or decrease the frequency on that compressor. So we're essentially able to open and close those switches to widen or uh, narrow down that sine wave. As we pinch that sine wave together, we're increasing the frequency, which will allow us to get more out of that compressor. And then if we were to stretch that 
you know, slow those switches down, stretching out that sine wave, we're going to slow down the frequency on that compressor. And that's the main purpose, right? We, we have to do that in order for us to get the efficiency out of the inverter compressor. That's where all the efficiency comes from, is the ability to adjust the frequency to that compressor. You know, I can remember some of those early generations of inverter boards that would have, you know, a capacity variance of like 35% to 100%. And now we're starting to see it going down all the way into the teens on its lower capacity. And people ask that question, well, how, how do we do that? Well, we get better with our IGBTs. Mm -hmm. And we get better with the control boards that are managing those. And that's what has changed that capacity difference over time. And so we're now really putting a lot of engineering, and I know Mitsubishi has done a lot with the engineering of their boards to be able to get that wider capacity range. And even sometimes more than 100% because we have that ability to manage those switches so much more efficiently than we did in the past. Yeah, Absolutely. And uh, I just want to just make it clear that the the three phase voltage that we're looking that's going to the compressor, variable frequency, variable voltage. To your point for that capacity, so we don't care what it is. It's not going to be two hundred eight, two thirty. Right. It could be any anything. The only thing that we care is that any any two legs are going to be equal. So it's U V and W from U to V. It's the same as V to W or U to W. That's that's the key point. Right. Balanced voltage. Yep. Sure. All right. So when we're talking about checking that, we, we mentioned that we have places that we can verify that DC voltage once we've came out of our rectification circuit and we've started supplying our capacitor bank, that we can verify that we have clean DC voltage coming in. Are there ways that we can look at the voltage coming out, particularly off from those IGBTs headed to the compressor? Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to depend on the equipment. We have our own what's called inverter checker. Mm -hmm. And that inverter checker uh, has uh, a connector on it. So any of our M-series outdoor units, we can actually use that connector to plug right in oh, to nice. the harness coming off of our inverter board. But the other side of that connector, we also supply just three alligator clips. And so we all we really have to do is remove the wires from our compressor, put a gator clip or an alligator clip on each one of those wires, and what we see on that inverter checker is a set of six LEDs. So each of those LEDs represents the switching of okay. each IGBT. And so when we're trying to check that inverter, we're that inverter circuit, we just want to make sure that each of those LEDs lights up. That indicates that those IGBTs are functional. Now, if you don't have an inverter checker, no big deal. We can just use our meter. You put our meter in AC voltage, we check across U to V. We check across V to W and we check across U to W and we just want to verify balanced voltage. Sure. Now, our service manual will indicate the voltage that you should see. There's a range and it's going to depend on the size of the unit, yep. the, uh, the specific, you know, it's model specific, but yep. you can find a voltage range of what we'll see as normal. But it's really that simple. We're taking AC, checking AC voltage on each leg of that compressor and making sure it's balanced. Right. A very important part of using that true RMS meter, if you're using a, a lower grade inexpensive meter that's not true RMS, you may have voltages all over the place because it's not getting accurate averaging. So as we move into diagnosing inverters, having that proper diagnostic tools are going to be absolutely critical for yeah. a, you know, what we're looking at is as advanced technicians. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very good. Now, what about the actual compressor motor itself? So say if we're doing a diagnostic and we've verified our incoming DC voltage. So we've checked our AC voltage. We've checked our DC voltage. We've used an analyzer. We've checked voltage coming out of the board, but we're still not 100% confident on the operation. Are there ways that we can ohm out the compressor like we traditionally would have done in the past as we were ohming out a single phase PSE style compressor? Yeah, I mean, so... When we're trying to diagnose a compressor, it's really not much different, right? The compressor doesn't really know that it's an inverter compressor necessarily. It's just getting three-phase AC voltage. So we're still going to check for shorts across the windings, and we're still going to check for shorts to ground. So that process hasn't changed. Now, what we should get for resistance across those windings, again, is going to be model-specific. So in our service manual, we want to find what that resistance reading should be. But it's that simple, right? We want to check for shorts across windings. If we don't have any, we want to check for shorts to ground using a mega. Right. Starting to sound pretty simple. 
Really? Yeah. Yeah. And we're back thing, to regular what, compressor land. Yeah. Right. But yeah. one thing that can lead you down a rabbit hole is the outside temperature. Dude. If that compressor's been off for a while and it's pretty cold outside, it's not going to ohm out properly or even neg out properly. So you might want to just make sure you warm it up a little bit because it will change the resistance. That's a great thing to think about, especially if that homeowner said, oh, I had a problem with it, so I turned it off until you got here. And then you get there and go, wait a minute, it's 20 degrees outside and this thing's been off for six hours. I, I might have to rethink my diagnostic procedure for a minute. We've got one of our, one of our instructors in, in his class will bring in a compressor, throw it in the freezer all night and bring it in, leave it in the freezer for a while. And he'll bring it out and have guys test it when it comes out of the freezer after being in there all night. And then by the end of class, they test it again. So at the beginning of the day, they condemn it. At the end of the day, it's fine. I love and, that. My God, yeah. that sounds like a good And that is due to the liquid, right? Liquid yeah. refrigerant inside that compressor. Yep. It's yeah. going to act yeah. as a conductor. And so we can see these false readings of shorts across windings with that ref liquid refrigerant in there. So we want to make sure that there isn't liquid refrigerant in there when we're homing out. Very, very, very cool. So we're helping understand that it's really not this monstrosity of a diagnostic procedure when we're looking at inverters. It really comes down to, let's step back and, and look at the basics, which we've always done in the past. And so it's just a new procedure for looking at the basics of how an inverter actually operates. Very, very yeah, cool. Absolutely. Well, what about motors? So we've looked at power coming through our inverter board that is supplying our simulated AC voltage to the compressor. What are we doing typically with our condenser fan motor in this scenario? So with our units that we actually use that 300 volts DC that we get from the diode stack from that conversion yeah. uh, or rectification to DC voltage, we actually will use that 300 volts DC to power our control board. Ah, oh, cool. So part of that is to drive our fan. Our fans are an ECM motor, right? They mm -hmm. have a constant voltage going to them, and then they have separate voltage for speed control. So we supply to our fans constantly 300 volts DC. Oh, why There's not? always 300 volts on that sure. fan motor. And then we also have, uh, it's all a single connector, but on the same, uh, on a separate pin, we have uh, a zero to six and a half volt DC signal. That's an output from our control board to the fan, and that's going to dictate speed. So when we're at low speed, we might see like a volt and a half. Once we get up to high speed, we might see five and a half to six. Okay. Now, I wouldn't recommend this, but if you were to hold back on the fan, we would actually see that voltage increase, which is the whole point, right? We want to make sure that we can overcome any potential restrictions. We always want to verify airflow over our coils. So because of that, we have that speed control in order to try to overcome any potential restrictions in that airflow. Very, very cool. And something Bryn said, there's 300 volts and a lot of plugs. And um, if you don't know what voltage is on a particular plug, the one thing you have to be careful is with the power on, you don't want to unplug or plug something in. Because that DC voltage does something easy when it arcs a lot quicker and easier than AC does. So you could have a plug and you'll unplug it. You won't notice anything. You won't see a spark. There won't be a flash. There won't be a bang. But you could just fry that board just by, by doing that. So unplugging things. And, and I think this should go without saying, but just in case, when you take the wires off the compressor too, that's power down. So we power it down. <laughs> We power it down and we wait for all the lights to go off, you know, give it a good 30 seconds, 40 seconds, let everything go off. And then you can start unplugging wires. Yeah. I can, I can imagine on that condenser fan motor, that outdoor fan motor, especially having our high voltage and low voltage, if that thing was powered on and I'm doing any types of check and I'm disconnecting that there's an incredibly high potential for doing arcing and damaging ourselves. So yeah, completely get that with our capacitor dis discharge time. Now, one of the things that we looked at previously with PSC driven outdoor units is that we discharge capacitors of PSC motors. Are there discharge procedures on inverters or we just allow time for that to de-energize once we've killed high voltage power to the unit? Time. Just give it time. There's no actual process as far as making sure. Uh, you can check, right? We can check exactly. to make sure that we don't still see that DC voltage. Um, but time is what's going to allow those uh, capacitors to discharge. Yeah. So with our M&P series, maybe 10, 15 minutes, you're usually safe to work on it. 
Yeah. And Clifton, I'll tell you a personal story. When I first started working for Mitsubishi, we had some equipment in our warehouse that came from a previous training center. It had been there at least a year, maybe two. And I went to get a board out of it. Mm -hmm. And when I pulled the board out, now this thing had no power to it for over a year. When I went to pull the board out, there was a tiny little spark. And not enough to hurt anything, not enough to fry anything, but I saw a tiny little spark. The warehouse was was dark, so it's not enough to do any damage, but that bolt can stay there a while. So we just give it a good amount of time, a minute or so, yeah. and then should be fine. Yeah, that definitely catch you off guard. I was reading in one particular manual not to touch the unit until you verified that you are below 50 volts DC. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. makes sense. That's getting down into a more operable level of, of current. Sure. Yep. Very, very cool. Now, when we're talking about DC voltage that we're using at a high voltage level for our simulated AC or simulated AC sine wave for the condenser motor, we've talked about using the high voltage DC directly into the outdoor fan motor with a low voltage control. We also have low voltage that we're using for communication between the outdoor and the indoor units. Are there ways that we can examine the low voltage communication on inverters? Yeah. So, I mean, pretty much everything when it comes to low voltage DC, just about every output to the rest of the system comes from our control board. So, you know, we take in 208, 230 to our control board and that gets converted and then knocked down to our low voltage DC for communication. But that's all done through the control board. Uh, we use low voltage DC for our LEVs. We use low voltage uh, DC for our thermistors. So those are all low voltage outputs from our control board. Uh, when it comes to communication, it doesn't change, right? Our outdoor unit off of the control board provides 24 volts to our communication wires, which in our case is S2 and S3. Okay. So on S, if we were to measure our uh, S2 and S3 terminals at the outdoor unit with no wires connected, we would see 24 volts. That'd be our supply. Sure. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we're coming from the outdoor units, 24 volts. We send that 24 volts through the wire to our indoor unit. The indoor unit when powered on, receives that 24 volts and sends back 12 volts DC. So that's how we get that fluctuating 12 to 24 volt DC signal. And that's serial communication, right? It speaking a language. They're communicating with each other. Uh, and so because of that, like we always recommend we don't want to see any breaks in those wires, ideally. No switches, no uh, condensate pumps to interrupt that. Um, you know, if we do have to do something like putting in a third party condensate pump, we recommend breaking S1 in that case, specifically because AC voltage, right? Line voltage has a lot easier time traveling through a switch, whereas serial communication, right? Zeros and ones is not going to have as easy of a time traveling through that switch. Very so we really like to see those home runs on S2 and S3. That, that wire connecting the indoor and outdoor unit on the residential equipment. S1, S2, S3, it's three wires plus the ground, obviously. But S1 and S2 is 208. S2 and S3 is, like Bryn said, the 24 volts DC. If it's bouncing, it's communicating. If it's a steady 24 volts, it's not communicating. And if there's no voltage there, then it could be, it could be a short on the uh, DC side, or it could be a bad board or something like that. But I want to get back to the, the meters, that 24 volts bouncing DC between S2 and S3. If you have a non-true RMS meter, it's going to almost look like a ghost reading. And those of us who use digital meters, just having the leads holding up in air, you'll see the little zeros bouncing around. And that's what it looks like. But with a true RMS meter, you'll actually see the numbers changing. They'll go 0, 12, 24, and they go all over the place. And interestingly enough, my favorite meter still to use, I'm old, but I like the analog meter. And you'll actually see the needle bouncing bouncing <laughs> so that's why i like and one of the reasons i like analog sure again try mess meter is is your your friend along with those needle leads wow so what i'm hearing is a good true rms meter check our incoming ac voltage into our rectification circuit check our dc voltage coming out of it Check our simulated AC voltage, which is actually a high voltage DC coming out of our IGBT board, our inverter control board. We can check our high voltage DC to the outdoor motor, low voltage DC to the outdoor motor, and our low voltage communicating. And that's about it in a nutshell. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of it. Yeah. 
And our manuals for every piece of equipment that we manufacture and every manual that we print for is available on MyLeakDrive.com. You can go in there, look up the specific model that you want, get the service manual, and there's troubleshooting charts, there's troubleshooting flow charts, uh, the equipment's there. Fantastic. The information's there, rather. And I think also just with boards in general, right? The general summary of boards is for the most part, there's not going to be components that you can replace on that board. So we really just want to make sure that we know the flow of electricity through that board. Our control board has some fuses, particularly on P-series units that are replaceable. But typically, we're checking for voltage coming in and proper voltage exiting those boards. If we're not seeing that, then that's when we start to consider replacing that board. So, you know, we don't have to get too crazy about, you know, changing out capacitors on boards or changing out diodes or resistors. Going to replace the whole board if it's not doing what it's supposed to. There's a lot going on with those. Um, so knowing your checkpoints, knowing what's supposed to be coming in and what's supposed to be exiting, that's your start. Fantastic. Mitsubishi Electric Train, we're so grateful for you joining us today. We encourage everyone to check out the Metis Tech Show to dive deeper into all of these aspects and a whole lot more. And we are grateful that you all joined us on Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC podcast. Thanks for having us. Kristen, great seeing you again. Thank you. You as well.